Hi, hello everyone. That's me on Twitter, so feel free to follow me and tweet and if you want to take photos, stuff like that, no problem. So before I start, I just want to say a big thank you to the organizers for putting on a really good show and really looking after us today, so thanks very much for that. And so I'm here in Belgium and I'm all on my own. Um, so if you see me around, I'm, I'm quite shy, so you'll probably see me in the, in the corner hiding somewhere. So feel free to come and say hi, ask some questions, that kind of stuff. So this is my first time in Belgium, and before I came, I knew Belgium was famous for a few things. So obviously you're famous for your waffles and your beer and your chocolate. But I wanted to do a bit more research first before I came. So did you know that Belgium was the first country in the world to have a national lottery? So congrats. You also invented the Smurfs, which uh, have kept my children quiet on many a weekend. So thank you for that. And you've also got more castles than any other country. So I'm definitely going to come back and visit and try and take a look at these, these, uh, these spectacles. So I'm from the UK, as you might have, might have guessed, and we're famous for a few things as well. Our British cuisine, for example. <laughs> <laughs> Our affordable housing. <laughs> you can buy this garage, I mean studio flat, for a mere 136,000 euros. And also our work-life balance. <laughs> Says a guy with a baby and a laptop and a music stand, I don't know what he's doing. Anyway, so I'm here to talk about changing software and how to make software easier to change. And it's said that the one constant in software is change. So how can we make our software easier to change? And that's what I'm going to try and talk about today. So in particular, one thing, this acronym OCP, um, not Omni Consumer Products, because they make some horrible things. Instead, I want to talk about the open close principle. So what is it? So this guy, this guy called Bertrand Mayer, he invented the Eiffel programming language and also the concept of design by contract. And in his book, Object Oriented software construction in 1988. He coined the term of, uh, of OCP. And OCP states that your classes should be open for extension, but closed for modification. And in this talk, we're going to explore what that means and show you some examples of how you can actually do that in your code. And more specifically, Mayer says that classes can only be modified to correct errors if you need to change or add new features, you need to create a new class to do that. So shortly after, Mayer and his, uh, his principal came Solid. So Solid is a set of guiding principles that complement each other that help us have better object design. And Solid was created by this guy, Uncle Bob. And it's made up of five principles, and they are single responsibility, open close, Liskov substitution, interface segregation, and dependency inversion. Obviously, I memorized all of that and didn't read it at all. So why is the open close principle important? So it's, it's risk and cost. So it said that if you're changing stable working code, you're, you've got a, you know, a relatively high probability of introducing bugs into that. So it's, it's, more, so it's less risky if you can just create new code without changing existing code. And also on the cost front, it takes more time to change existing code because you have to look at it, understand it, try and work out what's going on, make those changes without bugs, and then fix those bugs. So it's this risk and cost idea. And when we're changing code, we kind of have these two, two options, single, simple versus easy. So simple, on the left-hand side, this is where you make your code as simple to understand and simple to change as possible. And it has this kind of graph, so it's, it's cost up on the side and time along the bottom. So in the beginning, it takes a bit more work up front to make your code nice and changeable. And then as time goes on, you reap those rewards because your code's much easier to change if you have that upfront uh, time invested. Versus easy, and this is where like, lots of startups tend to fall down, is 
They just need to hack in, make the easiest, easiest change they can possible. And it's really fast at the beginning, you're shipping features. But then at some point in the future, you'll get to a point where change is really hard. And even the simplest change seems like it takes forever. So in my opinion, you should be gambling on success. So whatever product you're working on or project, you, you're, you're gambling that it's going to succeed and succeed for the long term. So you should really be thinking about the simple side of things, because in the long term, you, want, you don't want pain. So Dave Thomas gave a talk at Landstar Ruby this year called My Dog Taught Me to Code. It's a really good talk, so you should definitely go and watch that. And in that talk, amongst other things, he says, forget all the rules. So forget Solid, forget Sandy Metz's five rules. This is the only rule you need. A good design is easier to change than a bad design. And as developers, we need to embrace change. And you know, just like you, I know what it's like. You work on a feature, it gets shipped, and almost immediately, they want to change it. And you're like, man, I just worked on that feature. But this is our job. So stop your whining. <laughs> Let's embrace change. Let's make our code easier to change, and in turn, make our lives easier. So a slight sidetrack from OCP for a second. So what do you think is the number one reason that makes our programs harder to change, according to, well, me? It's this, conditionals. And the reason I say that is because conditionals are magnets for business rules, if such and such do a thing. And at the beginning, when these things are simple, it's fine. But what tends to happen is, they tend to be a magnet for your business rules, and your conditions get more and more complex. You end up with more and more branches. And then what happens is they end up being duplicated around your system, and this is when change becomes really hard. So if you can, try and avoid ifs. I'm not saying never use an if, obviously, but just try and avoid them. There are other techniques you can use, and some of those we'll see shortly. If you can't avoid using a conditional, at least name the concept. So at the top here, we have an example where we have a book that's on loan, and its due date is in the past, and it hasn't been returned yet. Instead of having that, try and name that concept. So in this case, in terms of book loan, this is describing a book being overdue. So name the concept and encapsulate that logic somewhere. It just makes it easier to change, easier to understand. So now I'm going to go through a few examples of how we can use the open close principle in a few different ways. And remember that the open-closed principle is about creating new classes without changing existing classes. So first of all, let's talk about inheritance. And this is the original um, idea that Mayer had of how you would implement the open-closed principle. So it's very simple to start with. So we have a car example here. And a car can accelerate, change gear, probably a whole bunch of other things. And if I wanted to create an, a new, some new functionality, like a convertible, for example. I can create a new class called convertible, derive off of car, because a convertible is a type of car, add the new functionality that I want, and we're done. So very simple. So as I, as I said, inheritance was the basis of the original open close thinking, but there are some trade-offs. You know, inheritance is relatively inflexible. Um, it's harder to compose things if you want to mix and match stuff. So we try and avoid inheritance if we can. So let's look at some other ways that we can do it. So first of all, dependency injection. So this is where you can pass collaborators into a class and then use them internally. So what does that mean? So here we have an example of a library. And it has a method called loan that takes a book. And it does a bunch of stuff, but the thing we're talking about here is it's going to log to file whenever we take a loan. Now, this is not particularly open closed because let's say in the future you want to change how things are logged. So at the moment, we're logging to file, but maybe you want to log to a database or some third-party service. If we wanted to do that, we'd have to go into this class, change it for that to happen. But we want it to be open close. So what we can do is we can extract out the login part into its own class and call it a file logger, for example. And then we can pass that in to the, to the library. So here we've got the constructor that takes the logger. We can, you can give it a default, so it maintains its existing behavior and then we use that logger internally. So in the future, 
if you want to change how logging is done. We don't need to touch this class. This class stays, stays closed. But we can extend it by creating a new class and injecting that instead. And this is how it would look if you wanted to, to call it. So using the default, the API is exactly the same as it was before. But if you want to have the option of having different loggers, you just pass them in. And it gives you more flexibility, because then, if, for example, if you wanted to log to lots of different places, you can create one logger that logs everywhere. And internally, it would just call all of your other loggers. So to an injection is for when you have a role that needs to be changed for a class. Um, so Sandy Metz did a really good talk at RailsConf this year. So if you want a more in-depth ex explanation and some more examples of how to do this, then definitely check that out. So the next one is decorator pattern. OK, so this is just around wrapping an existing object to extend its behavior. So here we have an example. So we have a method for importing products. It takes a file path, and it uses C and it's reads, this, reads it as a CSV file, loops through all the rows. It then does some validation. So if, if the name is present, then it does some stuff. So for this example, there's a couple of problems with it. So first of all, it's reliant on it being a CSV. So we could use a dependency injection to deal with that. So we could support other ways of reading files. So I'm not going to talk about that part for now. Instead, I'm going to focus on the validation and the conditional. So as I said before, ifs and conditionals are where your business rules, it tends to be a magnet for your business rules. So what's, what's highly likely is going to happen is that these rules will change. So at the moment, it's just the name that's valid, the name has to be present. But in the future, you can imagine that someone will say, actually, the product ID has to be there, or the description, that kind of thing. So what I really want to do is extract this out and make this class, or well, this method, open close. So how to do that is with, let's create another class. Let's call it product row, for example. And this can take the CSV row into its constructor and we store it. And then if we add this valid method, we can encapsulate that bit of validation in there. Um, and then we can use that in our, in our class. So as a quick aside, you can dry this up a bit. So if there's a thing called simple delegator, and if you're not aware of what it is, so you drive off of it, it's part of the standard library, and whatever, whatever, whichever object you pass into the constructor, it will install that, and then any messages you try and send that your class doesn't know about, it will get delegated to the object passed into the constructor. So this is much cleaner, nicer. So if we now use that in our original example, so I've just split this up into two methods. So the top method now just deals with reading the file from CSV. And then for each row, we just wrap each of those CSV rows with our new product row class. And then in the method underneath, we can get each of those, loop through them. And if a row is valid, we do some work. So that's a bit easier to read. And we've extracted out our validation. But we still have a conditional, so I'd like to remove that. And we can do that by using select, which is on enumerable. So now in our top method, we're just reading in the CSV. Each of the rows we then wrap with our new, our new product row. And we use select to just get out the valid ones. And then inside our method that does the actual business, the, the interesting stuff, it's just a simple loop. We just, for each of the valid rows, we can do some stuff. Now we don't have any conditionals, and we've extracted out the logic around validation. So, the decorator pattern is useful when you're separating concerns, for one thing, and also when you don't have control of when an object's created. So in this example, the CSV row objects, we weren't in control. That was created for us by the framework. But we can extend its behavior by wrapping it in a decorator. So the next example is the command pattern. And the command pattern is for encapsulating behavior in a class, and that allows you then to pass that behavior around. So in this example, we have an image class. And an image can open a file, and it will store it. And it probably was, you could probably have some other things in here, like you know, what dimensions the image has, or what color a particular pixel is, that kind of stuff. But we've also started to add some methods around effects. So we've got a blur method and a grayscale method. And when you see this kind of stuff, you, it's not a big stretch to think that in the future, there might be more effects you want to add. And if you did, you'd have to edit this image class. 
So what I want to do now is make this image class more open close and take out these effects. And this is how you'd call, um, call it at the moment. So you'd create an image, and whenever you call an effect, it would take the, take the current image, apply the effect, and return a copy of that image. And then you can chain those, chain those together. So the API is quite nice, but the class itself isn't open close. So what we can do is we can create some extra classes. We can extract out those effects. And then if we make a slight change to image, we can add this apply method that takes a list of commands. And then we can use reduce to go through and apply all of the commands. So if you're not familiar with reduce, basically it takes a list of things, in our case commands, it will iterate through all of them, and then it will end up with, a, with one single result at the end. And how it works is it has this idea of an accumulator, and you can set the initial value of the accumulator by passing it into reduce. So in this case, we pass in self, which is the current image in its current state. And then for each time, through the, each time we iterate through, we pass the accumulator as it currently is, and the current command, we can apply that command, and whatever the block returns, which will be the new, the new image, that becomes the, the accumulator. And then whatever the accumulator is at the end is what's returned out. So now we can use it like this. So instead of having a chain of, chain of commands like that, we can have just image.apply, and you pass in the class, the command that you want for, for the particular effect. So the key thing here is that in the future, when there's a new effect, let's say you want, I don't know, some polarizing or something like that, I don't need to change image. Image stays stable, doesn't need to be changed. I create a new class that does that effect and is responsible for that, and then I can just pass it in here. So the command pattern is all around encapsulating, encapsulating a behavior and then allowing you to pass that behavior around and use it. OK, so this next example is slightly longer. So hopefully you're ready for this. <laughs> OK, so service locator pattern. So this is around looking up uh, functionality at runtime, depending on, what, depending on what your needs are. So here we have an example. So we have a class notification center, and it has a method that sends a welcome, welcome message to a, to a user. And at the moment, it sends it via email. So we have this internal method called send email, takes an email address, and it takes some kind of content flag so it can go and look up the content for this particular message. And this is fine, no problem. But then what happens when a new requirement comes up? Your boss says, right, users love getting emails all the time from us but some of them want to get their notifications through SMS instead. So we want to add the option for them to pick SMS in their, in their, uh, in their, in their settings. So obviously, we do the easy thing. We add a conditional. We say, right, user, look at what their notification method is, their preferred notification method. If it's SMS, we'll then call this internal method called send SMS, which takes a mobile number, and again, this content flag, and then we'll send, send them an SMS. OK, great, fantastic, it ships. All goes well, your boss is super happy. And he says, a few weeks later, he says, right, that's gone so well, we want to add another option. We've got some super users that want to allow webhooks. So they want to give us a URL, and they want to integrate with their Slack or something like that for their notifications. And you say, sure, boss, no problem. Let's add another conditional. We'll check for webhooks, we'll do the same thing, right? So this is, this is like code rot to me. And what you see here is that humans follow patterns. So you go to a code base, you see how, it's exist, how things are done at the moment, and you just copy what's currently done. That's the easy path. And this is one of the reasons why I try to avoid conditionals, because you just see this stuff grow over time. So when the new requirement comes, no. No, seriously, right, we're not going to add any more conditionals. This is not the right thing to do. Instead, we're going to create a class. So for each of our notification methods, so for email, SMS, and webhooks, we're going to create a new notifier class. And they're all going to have this deliver method that takes a user. And then from that, they can get the information they need to be able to send. And they'll take this content flag to get their content. And however that works is not, not important for now. And once we've created these classes, let's do some small refactorings over some time now to kind of implement this and try and make this more open close and a bit easier. So the first thing is we'll get rid of all those internal methods and we'll just use these new classes we've created. So that's step one. 
Now, step two is let's just clean that up a little bit. So we had a big if statement. Let's just turn it into a case statement. We haven't changed the logic. We still have this conditional. But now it's a bit easier to see some duplication. So you can see we have this new deliver user welcome on all of those cases. So what I'd like to do now is just refactor that out and just remove that duplication. So if we just split the looking up into one method, so we have this notify for at the bottom, takes a user, and then depending on the notification method, we'll return the class that can deliver notifications in that method, in that way. And then above it, in our, in our existing method, we'll just call the method that looks up the class and then call deliver like that. So what I want to do now is just extract that lookup into a separate class, because I, I think that's a separate concern. And so now what I've done now is I've just created a new class called notify registry, and that has a notify for method. And you just pass in the notification method. So you pass in email or SMS, and that will return the class that can fulfill that. So now this class is now open and closed, because in the future when I add more ways to notify users, I don't need to change this class. This class will just look it up from, from the registry. And our registry just looks like this. It's just the big case statement we had before. Now, this is not particularly open closed because, as I said, in the future when I create a new class that does some stuff, I need to come in here and change this. So let's look at how we can make this open close. So if you look at this closely, you'll see that it's actually just a mapping. So we have a symbol equals a particular class. A symbol is a particular class. And in Ruby and other languages, we have a construct for this. We have a hash. So now we've removed the condition altogether. And in our registry, we have this hash that maps our methods to our classes. And then we can pick out the appropriate class from the registry using fetch. So fetch is a method on hash. And if you're not familiar with that, what, how it works is you give it the key you want to look up. And if that value doesn't exist in the hash, then it will return a default. So we're defaulting to the email notifier here. So the rest of this now is how can we change our hash to be more open close? Again, still at the moment, whenever I create a new class, I have to add, add that class to the hash. So we'll come back to this in a second. One of the benefits now of having all of these things in a registry means that you can power other parts of your system from the same list. So if we had, let's say, a profile screen for our user that allows them to pick how they want their notifications, we can drive it from, from our, our registry. So here we just have the notification registry, we pick out all the methods, and we generate a dropdown from it. So you can actually power other things from your system from the same place. So now the problem we have is, how do we populate our registry in an open closed way? And there's a couple of options. So first is to treat it as just configuration. And this might look something like this. So maybe in your initializer, if you're in Rails, or some part of the, load, some part of the load, loading of your application, you just say, well, I'm just going to have this as configuration. And this is OK. Um, there is a downside, though. It means that you have to create a class, and you have to remember to add it to this, to this, um, this configuration. And you can, conf you can forget. You can have typos. And there's a way to this to go wrong. But it is super simple and super easy. So there's always trade-offs. Another option is to maybe have some auto-registry. So let's get classes to register themselves with the registry and then be available. So one way to do that is by convention. So to do this, first we have to change our registry slightly. So we we'll remove the hash entirely and just have an empty hash. And then we have a new method at the top called register. And that will take a method. So that will be email or SMS. And the second parameter is the class that fulfills that that method. And then we just store that in the hash. So the method is the key, and the class is the value. And then we have our same lookup as we did before using fetch. And we can do that by adding a new method called load. And this will be called at the startup of your application. And for a particular folder in your, in your app, it can require all of the, the classes in that folder. We then look at all the constants in your system, loop through each one, and look for all of the ones that end in notifier. We can then strip off the notifier bit and keep the first bit and make that the, the method. So if it was email notifier, you strip off the notifier and just have email as the, the method. And then we can use const get to get the actual constant, get the, get the actual class. 
And then we can call, node, then we call registry, a register that takes the, the method and the notifier. So this would work, but there are some downsides. So first of all, your, your classes have to be named in a particular way. And the other thing that's potentially wrong with this is that you can have classes register themselves where they're not actually notifiers. Maybe they just happen to have the same name. So you end up with some classes in your registry, if you're not careful, that shouldn't actually be there. Another way is to allow classes to self-register. So let's see how that, that might work. So if we make a slight tweak to our registry class, and our register method now just takes a class and a class only, and then internally it asks the class what method it satisfies. So if, in the case of our email notifier, it would just respond and say it supplies email. We use that as the key in our hash, and then the class is the value, and then our lookup stays the same. So I've created this module here, so it's a bit complex, but don't worry about the detail. The important part here is this send notifications via, a few lines down. So this would add a class method to your, mod, to your, uh, your notifier classes if we, if we included it, and it allows you just to supply the key for how your, how your classes get delivered. It will store that, and then it, it calls register internally. And it passes in self, and self at this stage is the class itself. So how this would actually look, so this is an email notifier. We'd include the, include the module, and it gives us this macro. So send notifications via email, because this is our email notifier. And then we have our standard deliver method. So we, here, here we can call our class whatever we like, um, but the class says what it, is, what, it, what it fulfills. Now, this totally works. So if you were to do this, what happens is whenever this class is required, it would register itself with the registry, and if you power your UI from the registry, it would then appear as a new option in the dropdown. And when you actually go to the notify, we'd look up the notify from the, from the hash and use that to deliver. So it totally works, except it doesn't work. <laughs> if you're in Rails, that won't actually work. And that's, but actually, that's not entirely true. So in production, it would work because all your classes are required, and this would, this would work when that happens. But in development and test, your classes aren't required all in one go. They're only required when, when they're referenced. And because our classes are never referenced, they never get loaded, and so they never get into our registry. So you'd always end up with, with a default. And it's due to, this, due to this, this setting here. So how can we fix that? So how we can fix it is relatively simple. Whenever we go to look up a notifier from our registry, we can just check to see whether it's already been loaded. And if it hasn't, we can just go to our particular directory that has our notifiers, make sure they're all required, and then, then return. Um, we can set this flag to make sure we don't do this all the time. Um, so if you were to do this, this would actually work. And now I've got a small demo to prove it. So I'm going to do this totally live coding. Right, so here we have uh, an example. So here we have a dropdown where a user can pick the notification method. It saves it. And when we click Notify, it's going to send the notification by the selected method. And you see here in the log, just in red, this is the method that was used. So that was sent via SMS. So now, what would happen if I wanted to add a new way? So here we have an existing, existing Notifier. Just looks like as we've seen before. Oh, I should be typing. So let's say I wanted to add a new method that sends a notification to all existing using all existing Notifiers. So all I need to do is to create a new class. So, and I can call it whatever I like. So we're going to notify all the things. We'll include our module that does, does our magic stuff. We, create, we add, our, add our macro that, that says how, how we deliver things. We add our, our deliver method, just like all the other classes do. And I'll come back to this in a second. So I'm just going to create a quick help method here. This is going to give us a list of all the existing notifiers in the registry. And we're just going to do a quick check. We're going to reject ourselves. Otherwise, we end up in some infinite loop nightmare. And then inside, inside Deliver, we just loop through all of these notifiers we've got from the registry. We're going to call Deliver on each one of them. And so if this method is selected, we should be able to notify via all existing all existing methods. 
So I just created a class. I didn't restart the app. Now when I go to the UI, because this is driven by the registry and I have a new option that I can save, it saves it. And when I click Notify, it sends a notification. And when we go to the log, hey presto, it's sent via all the existing notifications. Thank you. <laughs> so that was a big, long um, example. And hopefully, I was able to <laughs> explain it in a way you could, that was followable. But the point here is that this was quite, kind of like an open close to the nth degree, right? I wanted to extend our application without changing any code. And I was able to do that by just creating a new class, putting it in the right place, and we had new functionality, not a single line of existing code had to change. And just talking about how, just kind of recapping how we populated our registry. So there was three different ways, and each one has got pros and cons, right? So the first way we looked at was configuration. The pro to that is it's super simple and really easy. You get a side benefit of that, which means you can register different things in different environments. So let's say you had something that called an external service. And in staging, you wanted to do something slightly different. You didn't want to call the ex external service for some reason. You could use that through configuration. The con to that is there's two steps to it. You have to create the class and remember to add it to your configuration. There's also the convention thing we looked at. That's really nice because you just create a class of a certain name. The downside is it has to be named in that convention, which sometimes you don't want. And also, you get the, the thing where classes that just happen to have the same name might register and try, might try and be registered. And then the last thing we looked at was self-registry, where the class kind of broadcasts what, it's, what it supports, which is really nice because you just create a class, you call it whatever you want, and it just works. The downside is it can be a bit too magical. So maybe you have new, new people on the team, and they just don't know how this thing wires up. So there are pros and cons to all these things. So the service locator pattern, which, what, what, which is what we're looking at at the moment, this is where you look up behavior at runtime, and then when change comes, you just need to create a new class. So for me, this is all about balance and trade-offs. And I've gone through a whole bunch of patterns there. Now, this is not a license for you to go out and go pattern crazy and just invent all these patterns and just apply them all to your code. So kind of use them where it makes sense. Um, and just good object design really helps with making your code more changeable. So here's a quote from a really famous, famous guy. So it may seem like overkill in the beginning, but as your code base ages, you're going to reap the rewards of good object design. And if you want to tweet that, it's totally fine. And yes, I did just quote myself. <laughs> but changing software is more than just a bunch of design patterns. What you need to remember is that code is much easier to change if it's easily understood. And that means naming things well, making things small, that kind of stuff. Also remember that code is read many more times than it's written. Think of your coworkers. Think of your future self. I know I've had the experience where I've written, written some code. I thought it was good. I come back to it six months, and it's like, what the hell does this do? I don't even know. So just think really carefully. When you're writing code, make it easier for your future self in particular. And also, as we saw in one of those examples, we follow existing patterns in our code, existing styles. So what happens is if you start off badly, you come back to existing code, you want to change it, you follow what's currently there. You don't necessarily change into a better ways of thinking. So you may have spotted a theme through this talk. And I want to just say it's really OK to create more classes. Right? Make your classes small, well-focused, named well, and whenever I say this to Rails developers in particular, they kind of freak out. And they're like, where do I put my classes? They're not models or views. I don't know where they go. And I would say, first of all, it, it doesn't matter. Just put them somewhere. Don't use that as an excuse not to do that. But what I tend to do is group classes by functionality. So maybe have a, have a folder that's around security or a folder around authentication or you know, whatever it might be, and group them by functionality rather than, by, rather than pattern. That's probably bad, I would say. So just to finish up. Some things to consider. So create classes that are focused on, on small things. Go look at Solid if you haven't looked at it already. And remember this kind of trade-off between simple and easy, like immediate, short-term 
short-term wins. And I know what it's like if you've got an investor demo in an hour, you just have to get stuff done, that's fine. But kind of think about it, if you have a bit more time, try and think about the future. And it's all about balance and trade-offs. And some guidelines that I try and follow myself is name things well, make things small, avoid conditionals, and also try and avoid nils. So I haven't covered that in this talk, but again, Sandy Metz's talk from RailsConf was really cool. So check that out. So I work for Loyalty Lion. We're currently hiring. I have stickers and t-shirts. So if anyone wants one, come and say hi. Ask a question, I'll give you a t-shirt, no problem. This is me on Twitter. Feel free to tweet me questions and stuff. That's it, thank you. <laughs>